My, my talk this morning is really in two directions. One is to talk about the national landscape of what's going on with regard to Alzheimer's disease research, and then talk a little bit at the back half about really how do you apply some of this work on some of the uh, research that's being done uh, at our shop up, up in Minnesota with regard to evaluating some of the new criteria for Alzheimer's disease. So about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, the first plan to address Alzheimer's disease was released. This was an outcropping of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which was signed by Congress in unanimously, I might say, in the end of 2010. The president signed it initially January 4th in 2011. And this established the advisory council that I chair that really has been charged with advising the Secretary of Health and Human Services on how to develop a plan for this country for Alzheimer's disease. As you can imagine, numerous meetings, conference calls, endless, 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 on to May of a year ago when the first plan was introduced. And since then, there have been continual meetings and conference calls because the National Alzheimer's Project Act also required that while the, the plan should be developed, it should be revised on an annual basis. Hence, we're constantly re reviewing what's being done in the field and are we on track. The advisory council itself is about 26 or so members, roughly half federal, non-federal members. The federal members are comprised of individuals representing agencies in the federal government that deal with Alzheimer's disease. And there's a whole host of them, as you can imagine, from the research side, delivery of care, et cetera. And one outcropping, I think, of this exercise thus far has been the fact that people in the federal government who are dealing with Alzheimer's disease are now starting to talk to each other. So, so these are people who, agencies that heretofore may not have realized that, oh, you're dealing with that too? Well, we're dealing with that, and they started communicating. So I think that's been a positive outcropping. On the non-federal side, then, about a dozen members who represent care providers, caregivers, state agencies, the voluntary health organizations, the Alzheimer's Association, the American Federation, et cetera, and then a couple of token researchers as well. This was the plan that was uh, released about a year ago, and again, somewhat of an ambitious statement, but an important statement as to what's happening in the field. The ultimate goal, and believe me or not, this was not a trivial issue. What is the date? Can you put, where, when can you put the stake in the ground? Some people said, you know, 2025, that's a long way out there. What about people who have the disease now? Yes, it is a long way out there. Other people saying, shouldn't we do 2020? Yes, but is that realistic? Are we really going to have an effective treatment and inroad on this disease by 2020? So that was the discussion. 2025 was the, the term, the time frame. Again, not perfect, but hopefully we will be able to either delay the onset or slow the progression of the disease by then. Alzheimer's disease is the catch term, and that's most important, but especially for the Northwestern Center, it refers to not only Alzheimer's disease, but related dementias as well. So clearly, frontotemporal degeneration, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular features, a variety of disorders. So the actual plan itself has five goals. The first goal is the research goal. The second one refers to clinical care. How can we detect people early? How can we make the diagnosis accurately? The third is what can we do about caregiving? How about people who actually have to handle individuals with Alzheimer's disease? What can we do to actually help these individuals deal with the disease more effectively? Fourth goal then is education awareness, and the five refers to metrics. How are we going to measure whether we're getting there? The research goal, somewhat broad, but at the same time tried to encompass the entire disease frame. So, what are the appropriate priorities and milestones to get to that 2025 goal? Two and three get at how early can we identify people, can we really assess people early on in the disease process to have a public health impact. That is, if you're trying to reduce the number of people in this country with the disease, 
you really have to start back early to try to prevent the disease. Four then deals with this is not just a federal plan, but it's a national plan. So we have to involve other entities, public, private entities, and certainly international scope as well. And then finally, this is not just an academic exercise, but we really need to translate it into clinical practice. So as part of one of the recommendations from the national plan, bring experts together to actually assess where we are with the disease and what needs to be done. This was done about a year ago at the National Institutes of Health. The Alzheimer's Summit was held. And out of that, several recommendations in broad strokes appeared. So session one dealt with interdisciplinary approaches to discovering and validating new targets. So as you know, Alzheimer's disease focuses around plaques and tangles. Are there other targets out there that may be beneficial? What about preclinical therapy? So for the drug companies out there, this is before I get my product involved. Are there general issues and principles out there that we need to address that'll help us all move forward before we introduce our proprietary compound? The clinical issue, session three, how do we characterize these people? Who's the appropriate person to put into a trial? What if you have a trial that's focused on, say, the amyloid therapy? Do we know that person has amyloid in his or her brain? So those kinds of issues are very relevant. The fourth was, what about using drugs that are already out on the market for another indication, but may have action against Alzheimer's disease? Shouldn't we be looking at those? And then, is the whole focus drugs? No, drugs could be lifestyle as well. So it may be that there are non-pharmacologic approaches to this disease that are likely to be effective. And then, again, we have to learn how to get together with the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector, put them all together to try to achieve success against this. Now, as I mentioned, the plan is to be revised annually and up to 2025. So to accomplish that goal, the advisory committee said to the scientific community and to the federal government, can you give us some milestones? I don't want to wait till 2024 and say, hey, we're not there yet. So can you tell us what we need to do in 2013, 14, 15 to get to that ultimate goal? And I must say, people took this rather seriously. And in fact, the National Institute on Aging said, okay, if the goal is to get here, how can we in fact assess where we are in the research field right now to try to actually develop milestones that will tell us whether we're on track or not? And in fact, what can we do with regard to funding opportunities? They invoked the use of this program that's now called IDROP, I-A-D-R-P, International Alzheimer's Disease Research Portfolio. So this is sort of an index that National Institute on Aging developed with the Alzheimer's Association to say what research is being done out there now nationally, domestically, internationally, and is this going to get us to the goal? So this is a big assessment, a big undertaking, but in fact has been accomplished. That enables then the federal government to develop progress reports and saying, are we there? Are we funding the right stuff that's going to get us to the goal? And that, uh, of course, remains to be seen, but that is the, the process. So you can't read this slide. It's busy and all that, but it says basically here's an example of uh, an index of the studies that are out there being done, who's doing them, who's funding them, when are they likely to produce results. This leads to another table you can't read that basically says here are a few goals and here's a timeline. Here's when these should be accomplished. So let's take the lower left then, those items down there, you click on that, this is all on the web, you click on that, and in fact you drill down and you say, okay, here, initiate phase two proof of concept drug trials for agents against three to six currently known therapeutic trials, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's rather specific that now we can actually call people on target a year from now and say, did you do this? And if you didn't do this, why not? Well, is it funding? Is it was a bad idea? Is it the fact that in 
that, that this was a bad strategy. And that may happen, but this allows us now to measure whether in fact we're making progress. This is the slide I put up earlier. One of the, the, uh, the second box down on the right says special initiatives to focus on research on needs and opportunities. So out of the Alzheimer's Disease Summit a year ago at the National Institutes of Health, certain concepts were developed that are appropriate for the field. They were approved by the National Institute on Aging Council and, ultimate, and ultimately resulted in what are called RFAs, or requests for applications. So in fact, RFAs were put out, the research community, many at Northwestern, have responded with applications. These are currently under review, but ho hopefully $73 million might be disseminated in, in search of the answers to these questions. So the process has worked. In hardly a year, it really has translated now into potential funding opportunities. And the plan in 2012 said that in addition to Alzheimer's disease, there will be a workshop held to look at the non-Alzheimer's dementia, so frontal temporal degeneration, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, and the like. And this was held just a week or so ago in, uh, in Washington. So I think things are moving forward on the research front. Of course, the proof is in the pudding. Are we going to get there? But let me, let me just digress for one second and say, has this resulted in any funding? Again, you couldn't think of a worse time to try to suggest increased funding at the National Institutes of Health or in the federal government in general. But in fact, in 2012, the president repurposed $50 million from other sources to Alzheimer's disease focused research. That has led to a couple of large clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. He had put in his 2013 budget $100 million for Alzheimer's disease. Well, you know what's going to happen in the 2013 budget if it ever comes to be. That's not likely. But in fact, because that RF, those RFAs have gone out, and the research community has responded with an enormous number of applications. The director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, has taken $40 million out of his discretionary fund and focused it on Alzheimer's disease, such that we can respond to these uh, RFAs. And the president has now put $100 million of new money into his 2014 budget. Now, that's his budget, not the budget. But nevertheless, the point being that he has put $100 million sort of hardwired into that budget, meaning that this is not just $100 million for 2014, but it's going to be 15, 16, 17 beyond. So if it in fact gets approved, it's a line item in there going forward. You know, the, the, the advisory committee, the council has recommended that we really need closer to $2 billion dollars a year for Alzheimer's disease research. How does that stack up? Cancer, six billion. HIV, AIDS, three billion. Cardiovascular, two billion. So, and success is being made in all those arenas. We're less than a half billion right now for Alzheimer's disease. So we're suggesting two billion might be an appropriate number. So in that sense, a hundred million is sort of spitting in the ocean. On the other hand, when everything else is going south, this is, in fact, an important statement that hopefully in better times will increase and get us up to that uh, $2 billion point. So uh, it's, it's an uphill battle, to say the least, but I think at least uh, the National Alzheimer's Project has gotten the ears of some individuals that, that may be able to do something about this. A couple quick words. In addition to research, the plan has clinical care goals, so we're trying to uh, uh, stimulate interest in the clinical community to try to identify the disease as early as possible at the Medicare annual wellness visit. Now there's a cognitive component that's required to your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing rate, etc. How's your brain doing? And th these will actually hopefully transcend into uh, increased education for people at all levels in the workforce. So people who deal with patients with Alzheimer's disease, we need better education all along the line. For the caregivers as well, 
we need to be concerned about what the caregivers are doing out there and the, and the job that they have dealing with individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And many of the other agencies in the federal government are oriented toward helping individuals with the disease. So ultimately, the plan is out there. We've got a tracking system in place to help us measure whether we're getting there. And with these progress reports, we'll be able to ask the difficult questions. Why didn't we get there? Why wasn't there success in this particular area? Whether that's effective, again, we'll have to see. Clearly, you know this story better than I, that uh, we need to get there. We're not there yet, but uh, many, many patients are developing Alzheimer's disease. So that's the federal government aspect of it. Now let's turn to some of the more applied research in terms of what progress we're making at identifying people earlier and earlier in the clinical spectrum. The National Institute on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association published relatively new criteria, so to speak, for Alzheimer's disease about two years ago. And now's the time to take a look at how are they doing? Are they making it better for us? New criteria. Well, are, didn't we know how to diagnose Alzheimer's disease 10, 20, 30 years ago? Yes, of course. And in fact, those criteria were pretty good. But we actually have learned a great deal about the disease process in the intervene, intervening years, meaning the underlying pathophysiology, our clinical abilities to detect the disease earlier and earlier. So this exercise was initiated again uh, two years ago and and uh, my colleague Cliff Jack I think was uh, one of the folks who really set a hypothetical model in place that really helped us design the new criteria so here's the model that says basically on the y-axis here we're going from normal to abnormal on the x-axis here we're looking at clinical progression from cognitively normal mild cognitive impairment to dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. This model states that essentially this amyloid protein that you've heard a lot about and with research being done here at Northwestern indicates that this is being laid down very early in the process. And Dr. Bill Klein here at Northwestern is one of the leaders in the very, very earliest features of what might be this amyloid protein being laid down. So this is the initiating factor, hypothetically. <clears throat> Secondarily, there is other damage done in the nervous system, presumably by another protein called tau, tau-mediated protein. And this is a, a secondary event to the amyloid deposition. Then we start to be able to image it with brain changes, such as an MRI scan. And only after all of this has taken place are we able to see now cognitive changes. Memory starts to fail, and then ultimately people develop functional changes, so-called the dementia stage. But note that what we're measuring here as clinicians really has a backlog of processes out here that have antedated the clinical features by years. How many years? Estimates are maybe up to 15 years. So here's a study from Australia indicating that this amyloid protein may be laid down in the brain as many as 10 to 15 years prior to the onset of clinical symptoms. So based on that model then, the new criteria say there are two sets of biomarkers, medical indices as to what's going on. One being amyloid deposition, this protein, we can measure it either by imaging or by spinal fluid. And later biomarkers reflecting neurodegeneration in the brain which we can measure now with MRI scans, glucose PET scans, or CSF measures. So what are we talking about? Neuroimaging in Alzheimer's disease. Structural imaging, what does the brain look like? Functional imaging, what, is, what part of the brain does what? Molecular imaging, what's being laid down in the brain to cause problems? So structural imaging, here's a typical MRI scan. Three scans here. On the left, we have a normal person the middle scan, a memory impaired person, the right scan, a patient with dementia. And focus here on what's called the temporal lobe, this part of the brain. This is a memory structure that is rather shrunken here, medium sized here, pretty normal here. So clinicians will look at that part of the brain when somebody comes in with memory problems to see if there's a signal there. 
And if you look at a bunch of people who are normal and a bunch of people who are sort of abnormal with dementia, and you say, where is this shrinkage in the brain? This is looking at the brain from the left. So here's the face, here's the back of the head, this is the left side of the brain. And as we spin it around, the colored areas are regions of the brain that are shrinking prematurely. So you can pick this up on MRI scan. So these are the regions now that constitute the earliest phases of Alzheimer's disease. Structural scan. Functional scan. We can measure what part of the brain does what. So look at these bottom scans here. It's again, looking at the brain from the side and from here. Blue, black is normal. To the extent we see colors like green, yellow, and red, it means that part of the brain is not working so well. It's not using glucose like it ought to. And we can see here in a typical Alzheimer's pattern on the left side of the brain here, this is an underactive area of the brain. And we can get fancy put numbers on this. So we can measure the amount of glucose metabolism in that part of the brain and measure it in different people. So here's the same kind of a scan now. This is measuring glucose use. So the colored areas now reflect diminished utilization in the brain. So areas in the brain where we're not seeing appropriate or normal use of glucose. So now we're getting a different pattern. Now let's look at the molecular imaging. These are cross-sectional scans. We're looking at the brain from the top down. And here on these scans, redness indicates abnormal deposition of this protein called amyloid. Remember, that's the protein that starts up front in the process. So here in a person with developed dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, we have a lot of this redness up here. Here's a normal person over here. There's none of that, no amyloid in the brain, and the person with mild cognitive impairment has a little bit kind of in between. And this is kind of what you would expect with regard to the progression of this protein in the brain. But when you go out into the real world and you measure people, what do you see? You see all combinations. So here's a cognitively normal person with a negative scan. Here's a cognitively normal person with a positive scan. Normal has amyloid in the brain. Memory impaired, normal. Memory impaired, abnormal. So the million dollar question now is, what's going to happen to these people who have the abnormal scans? Are they going to progress? You'd think so, but we don't really know that. We don't know that yet, and this is why longitudinal studies are absolutely critical. So the criteria then start with the clinical features of the memory disorder and add these biomarkers in the two classes, the amyloid and the downstream effects. The other thing that the new criteria have done is expanded the spectrum. Heretofore, we have diagnosed Alzheimer's disease right here the dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease. But now we know that it probably begins back up here at the memory impairment stage and maybe even back in the normal stage. So the new criteria have covered this entire spectrum, dementia, memory impairment, normal. <coughs> and the, one of the three papers then that describe the symptomatic stages is the one that diagnoses dementia, what you and I have always called Alzheimer's disease. And here's the criteria. And I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but I've got several uh, depictions like this. We've got four columns here. The first column is, what's the name of the category? The second one is, what's the probability that this clinical syndrome is due to underlying Alzheimer's disease, rather than strokes, tumors, other things? What's it due to Alzheimer's disease? And then the third column is, what's the amyloid evidence for that? Fourth column, what's the neurodegeneration for that? So here we have probable Alzheimer's dementia, and the first level is we don't know. The biomarkers don't help us. So this is how you make the clinical diagnosis of dementia. But what if you have more evidence? What if you have the clinical diagnosis and you have positive evidence of shrinkage on the MRI? Well, that increases your likelihood. What about if you have both MRI PET scan evidence of neurodegeneration and amyloid deposition, odds are this is Alzheimer's disease. No doubt about it. You look at the brain under the microscope, this is Alzheimer's disease.
But where the biomarkers may be helpful is when you have atypical presentations. So a language presentation of all, not memory, but a language presentation, or a visual spatial problem presentation. You get the biomarkers with that. If they're positive, still Alzheimer's disease. But importantly, we've learned a lot about what's not Alzheimer's disease. So even if you have this clinical syndrome and the biomarkers are negative, now you've got to think elsewhere. This is not likely to be Alzheimer's disease. So that's the dementia and won't say anything more about that. What about the MCI stage? We did a paper a couple of years ago sort of characterizing for clinicians what is mild cognitive impairment. It gives you the clinical features of what's going on. So now the paper that was published with regard to the MCI stage due to Alzheimer's disease tries to put this same biomarker framework into effect. Same four columns. Mild cognitive impairment. So this is just memory impairment now. Biomarkers don't help you. Either you don't have them or they're conflicting, they don't help you. Okay, you got the clinical syndrome. Is it Alzheimer's disease? Eh, maybe yes, maybe no. Can we enhance that? Yes, we can. So now we get a biomarker that shows amyloid present. Much more likely to be Alzheimer's disease. Or you get another biomarker that says MRI or FDG PET scan present. That helps me. And the best of both possible worlds are, of course, you have the clinical syndrome, biomarkers in both categories, they're both positive, odds are Alzheimer's disease, even at this memory impairment stage, likely at Alzheimer's disease. And then of course, look elsewhere. You do the biomarkers and they're negative, it's not Alzheimer's disease. Look around, see what's going on. And then finally, the most, I think, ambitious, interesting, exciting part is what about the preclinical stage? People are clinically normal, but may harbor the biologic characteristics. And Risa Sperling and colleagues out of Harvard sort of characterized this phase of the disease. Same category now, divided into three stages. Stage one, clinically normal now, but have evidence of amyloid. Stage two, amyloid plus neurodegeneration. Stage three, amyloid neurodegeneration and a little bit of a clinical wiggle. Still normal, but something's changing in this person very, very subtly. And of course, there's got to be a stage zero, right? This is normal aging. Not everybody who ages, as Marcel said, is on the road to Alzheimer's disease. In fact, a good chunk of the population is quite normal, aging normally. So using the scheme I put up earlier, Here's stage zero, normal, normal. Here's stage one, only amyloid. Here's stage two, amyloid plus neurodegeneration. And stage three, amyloid neurodegeneration with a little bit of a clinical signal. So this all maps nicely. Sounds good, makes good sense. You write a lot of grants, write a lot of papers, but is it reality? Well, let me look at it from two perspectives. One is, let's look at an individual case person, real person that we saw a few years ago, and then let's look at how these, these criteria perform in the general population. So here's a young lady, young, 53-year-old, came with a one and a half year history of sort of loss of self-confidence. What does that mean? I don't know. Not wanting to move. Her husband was offered a new job to head a department at another university, didn't want to go. Feel uncomfortable, let's not move. I can't think. Rapidly forgetting in conversation. Adult daughters are saying, gee, mom's just not the same. Not reading quite as well, comprehending as she previously done. Formerly was the human compass in the family, now was having trouble navigating. Sleeping well, not depressed. Medical history, important. 53-year-old, negative family history for dementia. This makes me as a clinician very nervous. I don't like to see them. But it makes me, I don't know what's going on. 53 year old who seems to have a real concern, solid citizen, but negative history for dementia. Because in young onset, you worry this is a familial form of Alzheimer's disease or something else, but not with a negative family history. So we test her, and cognitively, she's kind of average ish. So her IQ runs about 100, give or take on a short test, which is a mini mental kind of thing. She does 37 out of 38, pretty good. 
on a tension executive function. She functions around the 50th percentile. Language, she's actually quite good. Visual spatial skills, she's about the 50th percentile, but her memory is not what you would expect. So her memory is out of proportion impaired to her other cognitive domains. This corroborates her history. I'm not remembering as well as I used to. I'm not functioning as well. So at this point in time, we would kind of characterize her as this top role. She has the MCI clinical diagnosis, but we don't have any other information, so it's uninformative. So, but at the same time, in a 53-year-old, very, very anxious about making a diagnosis more uh, ominous than uh, forgetfulness at this point. So let's do some biomarkers. So my, my colleague Cliff Jack uh, in, in Rochester did MRs on her, and actually her MR was normal-ish. Not quite normal, but when we look at our normative data for how much shrinkage is allowable for a 53-year-old, she was fine. So, okay. But then we do an FDG PET scan. This is the glucose PET scan. And she now has areas of hypometabolism. So like I showed you earlier, here's the right hemisphere, and she has decreased glucose use in her parietal temporal lobe, and Val Lowe is our nuclear medicine specialist. He has a cutoff of about 1.3. She's 1.14. So she has evidence of hypometabolism. So she has a neurodegenerative biomarker positive. What about the amyloid? Sorry, here's the rest of her uh, skin. Amyloid scan. So we do an amyloid scan on her, and unfortunately, she has evidence of the tracer retention here, the frontal lobes, parietal lobe. So our cutoff is 1.5, she's 2.5, so she has evidence for amyloid deposition in the brain. So where does she fall now? Well, now in the criteria, she has the MCI clinical syndrome, but she has high probability because she has positive evidence of both amyloid and neurodegeneration at only 53. We follow her every year, two years later, now she's getting lost, frequent forgetting. Things are progressing for her. Her cognitive functions similarly have declined in virtually all aspects that we test. Her memory's even worse than it was before. Now we do her MR scan. Now she has more atrophy than we would like to see for someone her age. So now her atrophy has progressed as well. Her FDG PET scan shows more glucose hypometabolism. And her PET scan even has, uh, her PIP scan, her amyloid imaging scan, has shown a greater accumulation of amyloid over that two year span. So now, unfortunately, she meets clinical criteria for dementia and high probability that she is Alzheimer's disease. So here's an instance, unfortunately for her, and I wish we had the interventions, where somebody who comes in at age 53, the prior probability in a Bayesian sense, virtually zero for being Alzheimer's disease, but the biomarkers now really reinforce that this is what's going on. So if we had those interventions, if we had that, that vaccine, or we have that passive antibody, this is exactly the person you want to give those treatments to as early as possible. And this is where we need to go with the field. So let me wrap up by saying, okay, that's a case of one. You know, everybody has a case of one that fits your needs. But how about in the general population? So we're doing this study up in, up in Minnesota called the Mayo Olmsted County Study of Aging. And this is a, a truly population-based study, which means that we randomly sample people who live in our community, and we started out with age 70 to 89, and now we've expanded it down to age 50. And this is the original uh, scheme where we started in 2004. We see, pe again, non-demented people, see them back every 15 months or so. Uh, we replenish the sample using the same procedures down here periodically to keep the sample at about 2,000 active people. So this is what I just showed you compressed into the top panel. The bottom panel is 
just a year or so ago, now we've started to recruit the 50 to 69 year olds because we believe that the biologic process begins back 10 to 15 years prior to symptoms. So we need to capture these biological changes earlier in course. Busy slide, don't worry about it. Everybody gets a full evaluation. Uh, evaluation with regard to their history, their medical history. We talk to somebody else who knows them well. We do a medical exam, neurologic exam, and we do a cognitive exam on them as well. Over the years, we've acquired a lot of information, a lot of data, clinical data, MRI scans. We have genetic samples on virtually everybody. We had blood, plasma, serum on everybody. In the new cycle now, we're adding the 1,000 <laughs> new subjects to, in the, to replete the older cohort. We're adding 1,000 subjects in the younger cohort. And now we're doing spinal taps, we're doing FDG PET scans, we're doing amyloid imaging scans on these individuals to get a total picture of them, as many as possible. So, how do the criteria fare? Let's look at the MCI stage of the disease in the general population now. So, we can get all combinations of these biomarkers, people with mild cognitive impairment. They can be biomarker negative. We do it and there's nothing going on. We could get people who are amyloid positive, neurodegeneration negative. We could get amyloid positive, neurodegeneration positive, and we can get neurodegeneration only. We hadn't thought about this, but people who show signs of shrink, shrinkage on their MRI scan, hypo metabolism on their PET scan, their amyloid status is negative. Who are these? They're maybe not on the, on the Alzheimer's pathway, but they're very interesting to study. But do they exist? You bet they exist. So here are the frequencies. About, again, MCI, so they already have symptoms. About 12% are biomarker negative. Another 12 to 14% have just amyloid, nothing else, just amyloid. A good chunk of them, however, as you might expect because they're symptomatic, 40 plus percent have amyloid plus neurodegeneration. But very interestingly, there's another group that's about 38 to 40 percent who have features of neurodegeneration without amyloid. So they may be vascular, they may be tauopathies, they could be a whole bunch of things but they're clearly out there in the general population and fairly well represented. So what happens to these groups? Very preliminary numbers, only one year follow-up, don't go to the bank with these, but it's interesting. Here's the group that's MCI now, biomarker negative. A few of them go on to dementia, but not too many. A good chunk actually kind of go back to normal. That doesn't mean they're going to stay there, but they're normal on, on, on next evaluation. And a half of them or so stay in that MCI category. What about the group that has MCI and is amyloid positive? Well, it turns out not much happens over the next year for those folks. A bunch of them bounce back, and a lot of them stay right where they are. So they're sort of in between. So here's now MCI amyloid plus neurodegeneration. So now in only one year, we're starting to see some action. These people are now progressing on to the dementia stage. Clinical symptoms plus the biomarker pattern. Relatively small number go backwards here and a bunch of them hang out where they are. So 95% either stay memory impaired or progress on to dementia. And then this interesting group we hadn't anticipated no amyloid, but neurodegeneration, a good chunk of them go on. So they got something going on, and some revert back, and a lot of them stay where they are. Again, very preliminary numbers, only one year. We don't put a lot of faith in this, but it's starting to tell us a pattern that the cumulative acquisition of these biomarkers with the clinical symptoms does portend the likelihood that somebody is, in fact, going to progress on and we have to sort these out. So let me finish then by saying that was mild cognitive impairment. What about normal people in the general population? Again, here's the category, stage one, two, three, and stage zero. So turns out stage one is about 16%. Uh, so amyloid only, 
Another 12% is added when you add amyloid plus neurodegeneration. Stage three, with a little bit of clinical wiggle, adds another 3%, but there's a whole 23% of individuals who are in that degeneration without amyloid category. The, cat the clinical characterization only misses about 4% of the people, so it's pretty accurate. And again, 43% of the people are normal normal. So how does this same figure? 43% now are stage zero, 16% stage one, 12% stage two, 3% stage three, meaning about 30-ish percent of the normal population, age 70 to 89, are amyloid positive. But we still need to know what that means. And if you look at what happens to them over a short period of time, short follow-up, in fact, what's the likelihood of going from normal to memory impaired? The stage one, two, three goes up, increased likelihood, depending on that. So the newest kid on the block, we haven't started doing this, not too many people are doing this, is can we image this other <coughs> protein? Amyloid refers to the plaques. Can we image tau in the tangles? Maybe yes. These are slides from uh, Avid Lilly, Mark, M Mark Minton, showing that, again, the redness color shows that tangles are present, or at least we're measuring some form of tau pathology. And this is an interesting depiction here of a normal, looking at the brain from the side, normal, somebody with mild MCI, you're starting to see a little green here. Now we get a little bit more severe and then fully developed Alzheimer's disease. We're seeing a tangled tau pathology <laughs> pattern similar to what we see actually in FDG PET. So there's other biomarkers coming on board, I think, that are going to inform us. So let me ask the final question. Do the biomarkers work? Eh, maybe yes. We'll see. We'll have to see. In all honesty, we, time will tell. I think the cut points of what's normal and abnormal in measuring these biomarkers is not a trivial issue. Is the temporal, do, does amyloid precede tau? Not always, and I think there's a recent model out published by Dr. Jack again that in some instances tau may precede amyloid. Conflicting markers are a problem. What do we do with imaging and CSF, particularly with respect to cost? These are very expensive kind of interventions. We clearly need more data. And I think, I'm self-serving here, but I think we need to answer these questions in the general population before we can approve biomarkers, before we can approve drugs. We need to see how these perform out in the general population as well as centers. Let me say that, that this kind of thinking is, is actually infiltrated into DSM. For those of you who are psychiatrically organized, uh, oriented, DSM-5 will be coming out next week. Um, and this kind of thinking has infiltrated the new classification system for diagnostic disorders with respect, with respect to cognitive subset of neuropsychiatric disorders. So here's where we have been making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, farther down the road. I think we can move now into the stage where people are less clinically impaired, but we need to augment that with a variety of other, excuse me, a variety of other biomarkers to enhance our certainty that this is in fact an underlying Alzheimer's process. Ultimately, we gotta go back to when people are normal to see how those biomarkers, because this is when we want to intervene to try to prevent the disease down the road. So I'd like to thank my colleagues at the three sites of the Mayo Clinic that have really performed all the work and gathered all the data. I'm the one who misrepresents their work. And, uh, and, and close by saying that you know, is this just an academic exercise? Does this keep us employed so that we can get grants down the road and, and have a job tomorrow? Or is this, does this have practical significance? I came across one evidence that perhaps these senior moments that we all experience are not necessarily benign. Some dinosaurs sitting on a rock in a heavy rain <laughs> with the ark sailing off and saying, did I miss it? So I don't know if this is in fact likely, but this is a possibility of what, uh, what may happen if we ignore this phenomenon. So let me thank you very much, and again, I'll thank Marcel and the Northwestern team for